Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so just a couple of points to note in here. So I've provided some updated information on the amount of accession information requests that we've had. And I've given an accumulative from the beginning of the year, so it's actually quite helpful to see how the requests through. Um, unfortunately, there is an error that I need, you, need to point out. The, um, on page 34, the second paragraph from the bottom should have been omitted. This was a carryover from last time that we get the last time um, and it was basically I just wanted to, to highlight that we are continuing with those processes and that continuous improvement and training um, so yes so we'll need to omit that, that paragraph there um, so are there any comments on the official information requests Oops. training um. <laughs> I'm all for copy paste edit, but I think sometimes you need to do a review of some of the wording. Um, I apologise, it, it was something that slipped through in the edits. It was as track changes, but it ended up going through as track changes, so I do apologise for that. Yeah, it's a time I, um, when, when I compared this to the previous month, the April report, there was a lot of um, repetitive stuff in it. And I think one of the dates is incorrect because um, it was a correct, a direct copy of the previous report. Um, <coughs> just want to find that, Brenda. So, um, Karen, this is great. So, how are you going with your tracking system for all of these requests? So, so it's the same tracking system that we've we've always used. Um, we are putting some more information around training, providing training to officers. Um, we circulated some uh, some information on a flowchart because we've got a different officer now who's responsible for that, uh, and how we consider making sure there's the, the process a bit more robust around considering information that should be held and um, what those reasons are. So we've got an extra check in that system now, um, and we have provided some good different a new sort of process flow chart um, and we are working on a more developed um, uh, Lugoima process which is uh, customer facing so that will be on our website so people will have more information on actually what happens once they make a request and who it goes to and, uh, and, uh, and really sort of, you know, tying in with you know, the ability to, to follow up and uh, uh, inquire as to you know, how, how their request has been dealt with. Um, I don't want to put complaints but you know it's actually a lot of it is a Inquiries, um, as well as our online form, um, and then that will come out to uh, to um, councillors as well who who will understand how that process goes through. That's good. Good work going forward. Yeah, that's right. And it's improving constantly. That's right. And, and the more experience we have, of course, and the more information, the more training we provide. You know, then, you know, as, as always, the more focus you put on something, the more issues you see, and it looks like, oh, we're getting more issues, and it's not, we're actually, you know, we are providing more training, our system is getting better, and then we're just dealing with those uh, as they go. Um, but um, the information that we've had so far, it's not been, uh, it hasn't been um, enough information, enough time to review trends, um, but we will be doing that. Okay, okay. so that yeah. 21, is that, is that increased, yeah. decreased? Uh, well, we haven't. We, we're changing the way also that we record because I think uh, we felt that we've actually been under recording um, because of the, the process we've now put in place. Um, and more more requests for information will be logged uh, and tracked through, um, whereas we previously would only log um, requests that really required a lot of research. Um, whereas now, if it's anything more than I can just give you that information straight over the phone, we are logging those because they do require extra time and it's appropriate that we do log them. Um, we're also working with Shield on um, our new comms uh, manager uh, around logging media requests because we haven't previously logged those as official information requests and we do get a lot of media requests. And so Bloody me. <laughs> <laughs> And they do generate a lot of work for officers. And you know, we quite want to turn those around as quickly as we can because we understand you know, that um, things are newsworthy. Um, uh, but we have missed those. So it's, we can't really compare as good apples and pears. Yeah, okay. So that's why we can get our processes in place this time around and then we can see as we progress. Yeah. 
feel there's a greater level of confidence with staff who are handling these requests as a result of the training? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's certainly down. raised uh, up in people's because there's a lot of misunderstanding around what is an official information request. People think that if it's not logged, it's not an official information request. People think if, if somebody asks for, uh, for information and they don't say, I'm asking under the Goyma, then it's not an official information request. Of course, everything is and everything should be treated as it is, which is we do things in different ways depending on how difficult and how complicated it is to actually. Um, so there's definitely more staff awareness uh, and we've got um, Sawyer as the information officer, she's the go-to person, so you know, officers are really interested her and, and, and uh, you know, and she's been building her expertise up and people know that they can go to her for official information of her. Uh, and we've built it into our induction and training, so you know, so the, the, the main thing is by having a common definition of what Official information and is applying consistently and making sure that it all gets directed to one and managed. A lot of these used to sit in someone's email and they'll say, I'll get back to applying that person in a week's time, thinking of something to get back to, and it slips and slips, but it actually is an official information. So, what we're doing is making sure staff, as soon as they have anything that's a request for information, that is channeled to Zoya to block. So, we get the start of the system. And similarly to council as well, all, all yeah. official information requests that go through. To you, uh, you, know, you pass them on to us and you uh, respond to them. So we need to log those as well. So we can say it could be into a year ago, significantly. The process is, yes, it's hard to quantify in terms of numbers, but um, we've definitely been improving. Yeah, which is good. Um, bring down yeah. the Okay, so um, I'm getting back to the whole copy paste. Um, <clears throat> So um, if we have a look at the previous, at the previous um, report here, it's almost kind of like a word for word and a couple of figures can change. Um, what is really concerning is that last time we met two months ago, there was a, um, a complaint made to the Ombudsman. And again, this year, well, this, in this report, is it the same complaint they got taken or is this a completely new Right. It's the same one, and yes, and, and it was because it's the same as what we think is that we just so we didn't just that's right because it's the cumulative picture. If it's a cumulative, I get that, but can we, um, because it gets a bit concerning that oh, last month, uh, two months ago, you had a complaint, this month, you've got a complaint, so perhaps just framing a uh, uh, putting a time frame saying in this month here, she was complained. Yeah, I absolutely take your point, Councillor, and I think what we'll do next time is that we'll, we'll have that cumulative number, but then we'll also provide the information on what we've received since the yeah. last year. It just makes it look better. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. so, yeah. so have a year-to-date position as, and then a the, the yeah. reporting okay. period position. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. The, um, the requests coming through are more complicated these days and requiring more research and information. Um, I, opposed to what we've had in the past. I certainly feel that um, you know we, we're still getting probably the same volume of requests coming through, mm -hmm. but um, there are a number that are repeated requests, um, and they are for a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily complicated, but they take a lot of time to actually go and compile. I mean, particularly around financial information, Katrina deals with uh, most and reviews all of those ones. So. <laughs> To add on to, is that you, Charlie? Oh, Charlie and I both. Uh, yeah, no, I'd agree with Karen's comments. I think there, it's sometimes it's just an awful amount of information that people are um, requesting, and it borders on being quite unreasonable at sure. times. Um, and sometimes um, information that people request is that we literally cannot provide information that we don't keep the data for it. But um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't think that that's increased, to be honest, in the time that I've been here. I think it's um, it's just business as usual. Yeah. Thank you. I think, I think there's definitely, um, there was definitely a trigger between um, some of the, you know, the activity of, of council itself, you know, the committees, or, um, the, particularly the LTP. And so, um, you know, I've noticed we've had a, had a spike since the LTP, with people wanting some very specific information um, to try and extend to, to the LTP. Yeah, so there's, there was a number of those um, that you, you get. So, you know, there's, there's a number of just general inquiry that people have just with that interest. But there's definitely, um, when we're in a public arena about a particular topic, 
that generates a number of the coin over costs. And, and it was the same after the annual plan. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you know, and as we do better in communicating with the community, yeah. the community are more interested and engaged. Yeah. They yeah. ask for, yeah. you know, so so that's why we need to think about uh, the proactive release, and that's what we're doing at the moment through that that yeah. um, mm -hmm. policy. It's what would they what would be of interest to more people so there might be a information request and we really have to sit there and think well actually a lot of people are interested in this and proactively um, so yeah uh, but there are considerations around uh, the protections under the under the act so yeah. um so sorry can i can i just ask one quick question um so just using this figure 121 mm -hmm. 121 requests what do you, how many parties involved in that? Do you think 121 different people, party groups, or 60% uh, of some of, people? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we need to look at part of the trends in terms of whether there are um, a number of people who are asking, yeah. um, you know, are, are repeatedly asking for information. There has to be caution exercised around that. Yeah, people are entitled to ask sure. for information. Um, and uh, I think that there have you know, generally been some concerns previously around people, you know, people asking citizens too often. But they're entitled to ask for yeah, no, we, you know, we need to respond. Yeah. Um, and also, um, people think that there may be a, sort of a limit where no longer ask. Well, it, it's, not, um, it's not the person that in terms of the act becomes vexatious it's, it's only uh, an actual complaint itself or a request itself so we can't look on people <coughs> being vexatious because you keep asking us for information that's not how no, no, that's not how that. so the, the purpose for that was just if it's 121 requests and one person has asked 20 times yep. which is their right yep. that's what's making a lot of difference yes it does and i think that that's you know it, it is good to go back and have a look at that, that trend analysis yeah. um but yes, we shouldn't read into that what is not appropriate to read into that. Yes. Equal of maybe 20 different questions. Yeah. That's but right, it does, that's right. Yes, and, and good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely good. And it does it does lead on to that, you know, are, are people asking for information that a lot of people would be interested in? And that's when we need to consider proactive release. If there is um, a number of people who are asking for the same information a number of times, then actually dealing with it outside of the law in the process but it's probably the more appropriate way you know actually sitting down with people saying what did, what is it what's the information yeah. you're after can we do this in a better and an easier way that can help you with that information but you know not have it being dealt with you know under under this process which can be, um, can be a bit late but not actually achieve what people want to achieve um Alex. yeah i think there is an agenda item looking at how we can Tell the public what uh, what are the items of, of um, and how many requests per individual. I think you are working on that from an action item. And taking you know having the, the data so that we can actually look back and think, well, how can we do this better? That's good. Yeah. 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 Um, <coughs> then from there, no more questions on the board. Just to move on to uh, privacy act. So. Um, Zoya is also taking the lead on uh, forensic requests and uh, particularly breaches under the Act. And you, you'll remember that there have been some changes to the law um, around privacy breaches, and we are now required to notify the Office of the Privacy Commissioner if we have a breach. They do have a very useful tool on their website that helps you determine how serious the breach is and whether you actually need to notify them because, of course, they're, they're not necessarily interested in, in an inadvertent releases of information that you know tend to be with them or you know, when there's nothing that could have, have uh, actually led to that. Um, and so the um, the release that we had in question was very marginal on that tool, but we decided that we would uh, <coughs> the privacy commissioner in any case, just because we thought it was process to do that. And they agreed that um, with, our, um, with our explanation as to what happened and uh, that we would provide more training, that that was an appropriate response and they, they, they effectively didn't open. <laughs> that was okay. So, so it was and you obviously conveyed that to the customer. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Um, so moving on to the customer survey, um, I advised council at the last council meeting uh, about the customer survey. Um, yeah. This is just a, a bit more detail for um, councillors as to the survey methodology, um, and that should be coming out over the next couple of days um, to a selected few, 3,000 people. I'm sorry to but I think it might be used. Karen and I have quite a lot of conversation around this um, after the last uh, meeting. <coughs> just, to, just to share how you have been on this group. This oh, yes. Um, I think that um, adds to the story. Ah, oh, yes, but it was um, very um, um, helpful. Uh, colleagues in Marston had uh, Review of providers, and so I managed to leverage off their experience um, as to this. But um, looking at the methodology as well was quite key for us because we felt, particularly with the previous providers, that telephone survey, particularly a landline survey, was um, not really appropriate in uh, um, today. I mean, it's a piece we've done really quickly since you know, 2018 when we did the last one, um, and we felt that you know our for our purposes, uh, our community, we know just by looking at the responses we get through on our annual plans plan, that our community are quite um, computer savvy and they're quite happy to go online and and uh, and to, uh, to help our users and get uh, quite feedback that way. So that was the the, the preferred methodology, um, but also noting, of course, that not everybody has access, and so um, these particular providers who really like their methodology and online predominantly but to ensure that you do have good representation from um, I mean and they said it's not even representation it's just if you don't have other methods if you don't have online if you don't have posts if you don't have um, telephone if it's really necessary then you, you, you're just cutting those people out to start with so you're never going to be able to get the representation so we were really happy with their methodology um, yeah so that was that was really why we chose that and, and, Price. Yeah, because I think the price was virtually. <laughs> they, they tend to be, and um, and this um, this particular crowd also have a different um, different methodology in that they use a different scale. So we had a three point and five point scale previously. They use a ten point scale, which gives you more nuance. Um, they also do a, a much broader um, service than just what what we are focusing on. The survey is measuring against our key performance indicators. That we have in the long-term plan so that we can report on that um, in our report. Um, so the survey is looking at our current KPIs and our future <laughs> we are proposing in the long-term plan. But um, we do also have some supporting information, supporting questions. So you can drill down as to you know, are you happy? No, why, why are you not happy? What are the particular issues? And then that can provide us with extra information so that we can actually look at our services holistically. It's not just a reporting exercise, it's actually to help us improve how we provide our services. Yep. Um, we've also asked a couple of questions in this survey as well around waste minimisation, because um, I think um, Bryce has reported before that our, uh, our the levels going to landfill are actually still really quite high, uh, particularly compared to the other councils in the modern upper, and we want to understand why. So we're asking that particular questions on that, so that can inform our last minimisation strategy. It's a good question, particularly with the contracts coming due for that's right. So we've asked if people are happy to move to weed bins from bags as well, so we can get this kind of question for you. Um, so once you finish the survey, um, how are you going to um, appraise or uh, look at how happy you are with this particular company? Because I would like to see, rather than just continuing on with the same company, yep. I'd actually like to see some form of appraisal, looking, going down to uh, the target markets, you know, the demographics. Timing and you know, all those different things just to appraise the market and project spend. Yeah, I think that'll be really valuable. Mm. If we do so I think going forward, we've got confidence going forward. Well, I'm certainly happy with them so far. I mean, what they've been able to turn around in short.
So just I have a question just around timing. So the final report will be the 16th August. How does this sit with the I know we've um, something that Carrie and I have worked on that, that program of work was um, in the deliverables in the timeline of the deliverables. Um, very uh, forefront in our minds um, in terms of the audit. So, audit plan here in terms of the team. So, yeah, so this, we, this report would come to Council and then go to work and talk about how does that time even work? So, once this report is produced, mm -hmm. we're saying. Uh, yeah, well, well, it will feed into the annual report um, for the 30th of June, yeah. and you will get here here in September to review that. So, yeah. Yeah. so, yeah, so we can report back the report to follow up, um, uh, and then, as Katrina said, we will take out the, the results from, uh, measuring the key performance indicators and put those into the end report. Um, but we can have a discussion at that meeting, the following meeting, uh, as to the detail of and once you get the report, will you then um, look across all of the areas of council impacts on and look at changes that might need to be made or how we pay? Yes, and part of the report is, which is one of the reasons we, we quite like them, is identifying areas for improvement so they don't just serve you up what the re responses were. They, they can, you know, and they will do that to provide that extra information to us as a basis of, you know, we should be focusing on perhaps over the next year to three years in particular areas. That sounds as though it's a much more useful report. Absolutely. It is. We yes. mm -hmm. And we and we can pay a little bit extra to get that comparative data as well, uh, I guess, because you know the, the, the KPIs are fairly similar when it comes to providing services. There's only usually one way that you can determine how well you're doing is to ask people. And so you know it's usually around the same sort of questions around waste and you know amenities. Like so, um, so they we can use their knowledge and their experience they have working with other councils um, to get some comparative data. Great, right. has anybody got to um, I'd just like to thank Karen. I asked her the question. I looked at the date you were sending out the surveys, being the fourteenth of June, and then the reminders coming out a week later on the twenty first of June, um, and. Uh, uh, she contacted the, the survey people and I got a lovely reply to say that um, they put that date in there, but it's normally 10 or longer days after uh, after I started the survey just to give, they get a feel for what responses are there and then, um, then send those reminders out after that. So, that was really good and thank yeah. you very much sorry i haven't had a chance to no that's, that's, to you. that's fine that's fine i mean i i, I assumed that there was rationale that from all of their experience they know when it's best to actually go back out and remind people i mean we worked on the basis that if people were not going to respond within the first week or two they are probably not likely to respond anyway mm -hmm. uh, but it was actually good to actually this is my assumption that's going to find <laughs> <the answer. laughs> that's yeah. why they do yeah. that so uh, so yeah it was quite, it was quite, quite a comprehensive response it was it was very cool and very lovely thank you it's going to be interesting to see what responses are in the previous couple of weeks um, yes, I mean, the, the, the questions are still the same, uh, of course, because, you know, they're the same KPIs um, for, for this current year. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how, how far, uh, what changes have been over the last few years. Um, good methodology. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, the trick is getting a good representative sample. Yeah. Mm. And so you don't get a, a capture by a particular, particular group. You know, so you are getting a good representative view. Of what I'm and averages are really important to getting statistical validity of the number of replies is, is the critical thing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to make a suggestion with everybody's agreement. It is, it is a very busy lady, <laughs> and uh, she's here, of course, if we would consider that we um, jump ahead and then pop back and hear Anna's presentation. Mm. 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 Mm.
Right. Um, I haven't actually prepared anything um, specific. <coughs> um, got the report. I know most of you have spoken to interact with in various ways. So, does anybody who doesn't know Anna? I know. Jeff, 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 international tourists affecting uh, flow through through the information centres that you run? I mean, there isn't a number of people. And it affects uh, walking through. Yeah. Um, it has impacted it to a certain degree. Actually, it's an interesting question. I actually look at those numbers because the Visitor Information Network, which is what I cite, comes underneath, have asked exactly the same questions um, because nationally, they're looking at what is the value of my sites going forward. Um, in a pre-COVID world, because more and more people book online, uh, because there was an abundance of travel agents and travel companies who were organising itineraries that people could purchase through a different channel, my sites were probably becoming less and less important. However, in a post-COVID world, particularly with domestic tourism, they're becoming more the face of tourism. Um, for us, certainly as a region, the ladies out here are almost like our sales team, but not just sales, but customer service. So um, more community focused. Um, we, the ladies out here are on the phone talking to operators, helping them with their booking systems, making sure that their calendars are up to date. Uh, with the number of small um, properties that sort of went out on a weekly basis, sometimes uh, they're not always up to date to make sure the calendars are available. So we always want product to be in danger of being sold and if the calendar's not correct and somebody sees that it's sold out or it's, and it's not, then there's an issue and that's where these ladies are fantastic with their relationship um, with the operator side and also the visitor side to help Service. So I think my personal view is um, they are just as important, if not more, in a post-COVID world, um, not just for tourism, but for community. Um, the amount of questions, particularly up in Masterton, that are not, you can't make, you can't say that we made any money out of the question that we've had, but we've added value to somebody's trip. Um, for example, they need to find Few days ago, somebody came in and asked where they could post down the um, And that's a lot of knowledge information. Where else would you actually go to that? If you ask some cafe, would they know? But the information people adding value all the time to both operators and interests. Why? Internationally, don't know what their exact numbers are. Well, <coughs> maybe five Australians recently, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, so anybody else? Oh, sorry, I do. Morning. Can I just um, my pet my pet subject events promotion of. Um, obviously, we're doing very well. Um, do you see anything else we can do from our end to promote our market? Obviously, is is Greater Wellington. Yes. Possibly Hawke's Bay, Palmerston. Yes. Um, what would your advice or suggestions be going forward? Because more and more events are coming. Yes. And I think we need to nurse them along as a council support them. Yes, spot on. So that's in our destination management plan. Um, events for us, as you all know, we've, we've done very well um, out of COVID. And it's, it seems crass for me to say that, and outside of this region, I don't, um, because there's a lot of other people who are suffering. But as a region, we've done exceptionally well. 
but our most vulnerable sector within tourism is the event sector. Um, two reasons for that. We have a wonderful event sector that is the envy of many other regions like us that has evolved. It has just organically grown because of passionate people um, and very hard work. And that's fantastic. But when you get a disruption like COVID, um, financially, a lot of these events are uh, bootstrap. Um, own finances have gone into them. Um, people who are passionate, but they burn out, particularly if you put them under incredible amounts of stress when it's a moving from a one to a two or a three alert level system and your house is on the line. Um, so our, our, our ecosystem for events is incredibly vulnerable. It's really, really, really important for peak visitation from our very important Wellington market. Wellington know who we are. We don't need to teach them what we've got on offer. They love it. We've mm. got to give them reasons to keep coming back, and that's where events are really strong for us. So we actually need, and part of the destination management plan, and I'm applying for the second round of funding now, will be to do a um, really strategic look at our events um, environment, um, what's, what the gaps are, and how we can work collectively, all three councils, um, to make sure that we ensure for the future we are looking after our events and people who work in, in, in the events industry here because we really need it. Would you see an, an advantage in having sort of an events cluster? Yes, and that's um, already, we've been trying to do that. I mean, a lot of you know that events is my um, background as well. Um, so that's one thing I was very conscious of with COVID. It's created a whole different events group. We've been running um, mentor programs and um, capability building workshops around um, um, uh, COVID and um, cr uh, risk, uh, crisis management, health and safety, all of those sorts of things related. But a benefit of those uh, workshops is actually just getting the events industry people together in a room um, and talking because when you run an event, you work in a silo. And as you get closer to the event, you start bringing on volunteers or extra people but they're not with you. You hold all of the information and all of the risk as well. And so getting these key people, you know who they are after often they're running three or four events in the same room, talking about what's happening to them, their governance boards, their whatever. That's what we're already creating. But that's too loose. We need something formalised. Um, also managing your way, if you're running an event across the whole region, managing your way through the... Um, you know, process for regulation plans or traffic management because they change from boundary to boundary and the people are different as well. And I, I think there is absolute value in us collectively working on that to make that part of the industry a lot stronger. I'm just looking for a you know, on new waste management requirements and things like that, which I think we really need to be up to speed on yeah. um, because we don't want to be questioned no. as an organisation. Yeah, so at least it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, all of the events also want, want to do more in terms of recycling and, and that sort of thing, and but are also constrained by you, know, you, you can you can recycle and, and reuse as much as you can. But what when, when the event ends, where do you take that, and what are the facilities available to you? So, so what's the point in separating stuff out if it all just gets put in? So there is a there's also a chicken and egg. Thing there as well, um, but that's whole part. That's that's the whole ecosystem that needs to be looked at. Thank you. <laughs> and at the destination management plan, how's that been formulated? Um, then it's been formulated by PB, uh, <coughs> Ministry of Business and Information, whatever else they are. Um, they have a set of I think it's 21, 16. Um, points that make up a destination management plan. And it's, um, it's a framework or an approach that they have officially adopted here for New Zealand and they've taken it from overseas um, research reports. And when COVID happened, they said, right, um, every region in New Zealand must have a destination management plan. They need to look at all these 16 different points, which includes things beyond what tourism destination wide. So marketing, um, generally ours is marketing 
PPR, but it then looks at product development, capability building, um, the environment, the impact on the environment, transport, connectivity, skills, all sorts of whole raft of things um, to look at, again, the whole industry in, in this region. And um, it is going to be an incredibly important document. And what I've been doing is facilitating um, consultants, key people to come in and have a look at our, our industry and give us their feedback. We've never had the money to do that before the government has been handing out. To, to, but for other region, regions, they've been using it to survive. We've been in a, 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 a situation where we haven't needed that money to do that. So I've invested it all into the future and ensuring that when this is over, we have a, um, a roadmap to success for tourism in this region. So the, the, the last paragraph under the destination management plan <coughs> suggests that there's going to be a greater plan for this one. Yes, so that feeds into um, the Greater Wellington Regional Destination Management Plan, um, which has been put together by Wellington NZ. And they take each region's destination management plan. Um, so Kevity, us, well, Hart, we well, <coughs> put them all together and that becomes um, a regional investment plan. Uh, and I think that sits alongside, there's, there's more work, you'll know more about this in terms of the, the whole regional investment plan. And my understanding is the key projects that are of interest to that one to me and us will bubble to the top and that will attract, or somebody um, will say central government, thank you very much, we need, let's, let's say, for my example, I might say that the trains connectivity, yeah. this is something that's really important for us for tourism, but also for other aspects of our economy, we need more investment into this area. And if it's in the investment plan, then central government are going, okay, we'll be considering this, you've got the, the numbers behind you, then we will look at this. And the same goes for our destination national plan. If there's something on there that needs additional funding, for example, Five Towns Trails, that would be sitting in there as well. If there's a point that we go, right, as a region, we need some cash to make this bit work. We've already sat around the table, it's in the destination management, and there's every reason why we need it. And they go, okay, we can we can legitimately not rubber stamp it, but look at it. Okay, so, so destination my rep, so per se won't lose its individuality. Under the destination management plan? Um, well, I'd hope not, because we will have our, on paper, on paper, it will say the way of our destination management plan. And in the document, um, we, it spells out a bit from up there. Actually, it's, it's not, I'll clarify that, geographically, it's not by council boundary. It's by how the tourists travel through the region. Um, so it does, we, we include um, Nagatanoka in a lot of what we do because tourists come through there, they look to us when they look to support, they look to us for assistance with events, this, that, where are their key market, but also from an iwi perspective, um, Rangitane and Kahunu don't follow council boundaries. So within tourism as well, when we, when we start looking at that, um, it's, it's kind of the lower east coast area, <laughs> so the wider upper valley is what this destination management plan will be called. Um, I hope that it is a document that is alive and kicking, and that all councils, all associated parties know about it, understand it, and work towards it. Okay, so the, the draft. <laughs> Will be next month. Hopefully, yes. To be completed by the end of the year. Yeah. After. yeah. So the draft is um, it's a document that's going to have a lot of references and a lot of stuff in it. And when it's finalised, the draft, when it's finalised, will be a big read. Obviously, it's, it'll be my <laughs> yeah, big read. <laughs> um, it's not something that, that will be easily absorbable by most people. It's something, of course, that I will look through and live and, and my staff members and 
councillors as well if they choose to, but we will get that spilled down into something that we're eligible for, um, for everybody to understand yeah. what our aspirations are in tourism, um, what are our key strengths, what do we like, what we don't like, what we want to see for the future, and, and some of the plans in it are already stuff that we know, you know, dark skies, five towns, a lot of it's web stuff, so we have a bit of product development opportunities. We already know that we want to sit on, but we'll be on a piece of paper as well. I just think that's something we need to keep an eye on oh, yeah. Yeah. closely. So the, 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 the destination management plan just turns out to be an advantage. For the and certainly we wouldn't want Wellington just somehow merging you in. It's not. No, I, I wonder, I've been a very careful um, MB and Tourism New Zealand, most of the they want us to work together as regions on these decisions and for efficiencies. And I absolutely get that, I absolutely understand that. But my personal view is I've, I've, we, there's a timeline that Wellington wants us to have stuff done, which I'm trying to make, but I'm not going to, risk not doing the best job for this region and creating the best destination management plan for this region because Wellington has a timeline. And because we have to play nicely with them, as you said so. We will we do play nicely, absolutely. But it's never going to be at the detriment of this region and the benefits of this region. I mean, just when you look at the figures um, how the different regions are doing, it's just extraordinary. I know. Well, you've done. Yes. We've done. Yes, so we have. And it's we got reaching because well, we get absorbed into the Wellington region and a lot of stuff. It's when they split out by um, councils, etc., that we actually really shine. But if we're pulled into the Wellington, Greater Wellington Regional Hub, you know, they so take us down. Some of the negatives, there's no growth happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am. Um, I, a personal opinion of mine is that this our tourism success and our agriculture success is an amazing opportunity for a, for a real sense of pride for this region, and I think it's something that we have had as you mentioned before. The ability to go in the papers, they're saying we're a rock star, we know that now they're telling you, you know, and for people who live here, it's kind of cool, it's a nice place to be. Oh, sorry, Anna, I've got a couple more. Um, you mentioned the domestic marketing campaign account uh, to support events. How is that going? Have there been any recipients in the YRO from that fund? Yes, they have. Um, so the Great Town. Yes, that's right. The, the um, Festival of Christmas has been a recipient. Um, one to one has also been recipient. So good. At the moment, it's all South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so it's excellent. Yeah, no, it's excellent. No, no, I mean one to one. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the other two councils don't know that nothing's yet been put forward. So you're in a public environment now. So. Yes. Okay. Everyone knows that. There are applications in the pipeline. Any more? Or is that those are the two so far? It's two so far. So there. Um, of course, it's a. It's a regional um, thing, so anyone in the region can put an application for funding. It's been managed out of um, Wellington NZ through their major events team. They have a very robust system, um, checks and balances, staff to manage it. Um, the, I do sit on the panel and I can't get involved in any of the applications, um, but certainly um, where there is an opportunity for somebody to put one on, and I've said it to anyone who has an event, you'd be mad not to look at the criteria and see if you can make it fit. And um, that is my message for all events in this region. Some just, it's all about um, increased visitation, it's to replace the international market. So if you've got a small event and you're only going to increase it by a couple of hundred, that's not what they're looking for. We talk about thousands and filling up the region accommodation lines. So it has, it has to fulfill certain criteria. There's no reason that somebody out there who's got a small event, proven market for it, that they want to scale up. Um, and 
that would be great. I mean, there's, there's some fabulous events. Um, so just before we leave that, I'll just uh, pass on a compliment. Um, get a chance to have a one-to-one -one approach to us, obviously, for the river tree setting, and they were effusive about the role that uh, Destination Wairapa played and actually facilitating the access to the funding. I will actually circulate that to Council Center. Yes. I think it's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, the, um, going down into your um, financials, one of the, I know that you've given a, a um, holiday for membership, but what are the costs of me, uh, the benefits of membership dollar wise versus the cost to collect? Have you ever done an analysis of that? No, I haven't, haven't looked at that. The, the cost to collect at the moment, as the eyesight team ring around and check with booking systems and various other activities, or our marketing team are checking in for. Um, uh, media coming through or whatever. If they haven't paid, then it will be a gentle, by the way, yeah. little service that we're doing, by the way, if you realise your invoice is up to. Um, there isn't a lot of cost to collect at this point, and it, there's not a, because we've also got the backstop of the state funding, um, it certainly takes the heat out of having to push people along, and I think it's, it's a nice place to be because People are still a little nervous about what the future holds, um, and so they're reluctant to perhaps with their money all the time. Um, so we, we, we notice that, and, and also people are trying to decide whether they want to stay in the industry. I've had a number of members who have said, look, we really support Destination Wire, but I'm not sure if this is me going forward. It's been a really you know, up and down for the year, and I quite like to just retire and get my and I might just long term leases and a lot of properties do long term leasing because it's easier, it's less stressful. Um, so some people are still trying to decide what they want to do, and I don't want to push too much. Um, with regards to your current activities, what percentage of your activities do you think could be labeled economic development versus tourism and marketing? Uh, most of it's all on me um, for the economic development stuff. Uh, so the marketing team are pretty much all doing just pure marketing. Barb does a little bit in terms of the product development side of things. Um, don't we do much? I'd love to split myself in two and, and have, <laughs> Quite yeah, have a regional manager and a me. EBA. EBA person. I That's love, a topical conversation. Yeah, because yeah. I love economic development. That is also my background. Um, it's looking at the inward, inward investment opportunities, and particularly for us, around agriculture and food is just outstanding. Um, and I'd love to see more done in that space, but there just isn't the capacity to do that. And so, my final question, yeah, would be what with regards to your, I mean, no, you, you take as much money as you could. No, no, ignoring the stat funding. Yep. Are you resourced enough to do the job? Oh. Short answer, no. Um, there's, looking at the budgets, which I'm making up for the year coming, there is a business as usual. And before I started, um, the marketing team worked really hard at, um, getting the best thing for the back. And what they, what they do is, it was also digital, social media, um, <coughs> our relationships with media to invite people to come and do films and then they write stories. So it was the least cost marketing and they got, considering they had very little money, they've had, they had so much traction. And interestingly enough, I think a lot of that groundwork and that personal relationship and the, and the real hands-on approach um, has led to in this environment now, we've got media getting in contact with us saying they'd love to come through to write for Flora or for you know, um, North and South or whatever magazine are coming to us rather than us pitching to them, which is fantastic. And that we, we as an organisation, we kind of just survived, I think. It just it did well under those circumstances. My worry is you take away the step funding and there is 
campaigns that they're doing for Country Village Heaven and, and bringing together the Castle and Winter Festival as well, and as a regional approach to bring people to the region for school holidays, July. It's full already. That's it's insane. And our message is we've got so much happening for the July school holidays. If you're coming, walk early because you will be disappointed. Who would have thought that we would have been in that place? So it's amazing when you give a group of really committed, enthusiastic, hard-working people a bit of extra money, what they can turn out. So billion dollar question is what what do you think we've got to up the game to you for you, not not unlimited budget, no, no. and ignoring any EDA, yeah. what do you need from us? Yeah, I can't put a figure on that right now, no. but certainly more investment into marketing and having the ability to run some decent campaigns. Not not just recycling nice photos through social media, but really doing some chunky good stuff. And also I'm not saying like, any TDC, none of that above the line stuff. We can work smart with our digital channels, um, but we still need to do the creative and make it look slick because we're we're not we're a slick community, and tourism wise, we've got to look the game too, not some poke it together thing that you put out that looks a bit. Using ten year old photos. Yeah. Yeah, that's my question. Thank Absolutely. <laughs> and so the importance of the destination management plan, because all that that all Guy Hammer just said, yeah. it's a good way to, to ruin it all, and that's to be absorbed by Wellington. Yep. Ooh. More on that in a different forum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, know, I thought, thought your report was one of the best that we've ever had from yeah. Destination oh, Wild yeah. Thank and, you. and I'd like to commend you on that. And I, I love the fact that you could put the photos in and um, what you were doing on the social activity side of things. And, and I really I really thought it was fantastic. So thank you. Thank and you. I, yeah. I'd like to um, I'd like to have at some point a discussion around data. Um, Alex and I have had this discussion a few about infometrics information and, and it might be worth at some point, probably not this forum, but I said I just put it out there that um, tourism data is really unreliable at the moment. They're trying to work out where that fits. But there are metrics, market theory, different places, and I would love to be able to have a dashboard under my report to have some decent data and it makes sense. And um, I know that, for example, Masterton has infometrics, but do, do you? No, it's it's one of the expense we picked up. We could, I think. Um, yeah, we would be considering yeah, um, yeah. we do have another regional provider to provide us with our demographic information. So right. we, we do have a dashboard with some information from them that yeah. we are uh, working to go to our website. But we can have a discussion about the extra information because uh, I'm presuming it doesn't extend to. Uh, no, no. no, and I just think that would be my <coughs> Now that we are sitting at the top of the tables, it'd be quite nice. To but you're right, because I, I can't stress how important tourism is for the South Wire, but we hit a population compared to the other two councils that contribute. Yeah. yeah. It's very precious mm -hmm. to us. That's right. Uh, if you look at the spend that you've included to February, you know, we're 51 million versus uh, Marsden's 80 versus Carlson's 11, but we're only half the size of Marsden. So it's very important. That's right. And I also think with the destination management plan, it's going to highlight areas of investment, so where the opportunities are. And so when it comes for inward investment, if somebody's got the slightest idea they want to build a brewery here or a new restaurant or a new hotel, they'll look at the plan and go, oh, opportunity. Okay, what does the data currently say to me? And we don't have that. Thank you. We have very happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was great report. I mean, having worked on and off with DW over the years and worked with media coming in and that kind of thing, it's, it was such a good mm. relationship and they always done that very personal mm. level of care that you give to juniors or whatever. I think it makes a massive difference. So seeing some of those results there. Thank you so much. Great to have you along. Fantastic report. Thank you. Thank you. Great report. Thank you.
Yep, get the bones moving again. <laughs> Twenty to twelve. Twenty to twelve. It's right here. Oh, thank, thank God. Not like that's mine. Policy and governance. No, no, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Order. 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 So, I'd like to recommend that we receive the audit of the 2021 and 2031 LTP consultation document report. You're ready to second in order to pay. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I'll hand over to um, Katrina on this, but I'd just like to say congratulations to you and your team. Huge mm -hmm. congratulations to everyone involved. It's been uh, a long process and reading the audit report, it's very clear that they were very, very impressed with the consultation document, mm -hmm. methodology and financial modeling. And I think um, all of the from stuff District Council should put a huge hit on the backs because to receive an unmodified order of report is very good. So um, there's a few questions that we'll come up with through this, but I, I just want to say thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leon. Take it back to the team. It has, been, it has been a massive effort from, um, from all of us. Understatement. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd really value it as well. Finance will be risky, simply not every staff member to say uh, huge congratulations. Yeah, and I hope the encouragers do that. Yeah, and send up there for the level of uh, feedback, um, all of the submissions we received, it was an outstanding result. And particularly when we compare it to our brothers and sisters up the road. Well, you're right, considering me, the number of rate payers we've got compared to us. So, Huge. I think uh, compared to Master and roughly, the figures we had roughly four or five times the number mm. of submissions, which is huge. Well, actually, it's good because it shows people are engaged or interested in what we're doing. That's right. So it's also the quality of the submissions. Yes. And considered as opposed mm. to just, I want to draw a date. Mm. Mm. And, mm. and of course, not just the LGP, but also the spatial family. Yeah. So, so well done, and I appreciate you seeing it. Mm. Okay, Katrina, for Okay, so I'll take it that um, that the report is read. Um, um, as as they has said, it is an unmodified audit report, which um, is really fantastic news uh, for the team uh, that put the consultation document together and in the draft uh, long term plan. Uh, so this this audit was. Uh, obviously around the consultation document and the financials and all of the assumptions and everything that's sat behind that. So the auditors are back now this week doing their, um, hopefully, their final audit on um, the, the uh, document that we have um, produced after all the deliberations that um, you have all made and um, the um, What's the word? Um, the indicative decisions that you've made around the long term plan. So that's what they're here, they're back for. Um, so they did um, give us um, some feedback, which was really fantastic. It's always good to get feedback from our auditors. Um, so they did issue four instances of matter, which I am um, sure you have all read. Um, 
about water reforms. That was just standard across everyone. Uh, they did um, put something in there about the best and wastewater treatment plant, which we also um, was no surprise to us. Um, we worked really hard with the auditors to ensure that they had enough information to be able to provide us with an unmodified audit report. Um, so there was a lot of um, team effort going in around uh, that and working with the um, with our auditors and um, they, they sent that to the COP review, the Office of the Auditor General COP review, and they had some questions. So there was a lot of work that went into ensuring that we um, we got this through <laughs> and that they're happy with the way that we have presented the information around the Pepperston Wastewater Treatment Plant. So I think that for, um, for the team was a really fantastic result. Um, they, they also they put an emphasis on matter around our forecasting of three water assets based on age only. So this is with uh, Wellington Water and um, Wellington Water are actively working with the auditors as well, as well to, um, to satisfy the requirements in this area. Um, and of course, as we have um, mentioned previously, our ambitious capital program of work, um, Audit New Zealand and the Officer of, this, of the Auditor General are um, concerned with the deliverability of the capital program across the nation. So this is not just South Wairarapa, um, that because everyone, all councils have lifted their, um, their investment, especially around the infrastructure in Three Waters, there's a capacity issue with how, who, who have we got to deliver this, especially with, um, you know, borders still effectively closed to, um, to immigrants coming in to do some of that work. So uh, that's the other emphasis of the picture. Um, any other questions? I thought I'd just bring those up, but yes, there's lots of positives in here, which we're really happy oh, about. So um, if you, I'll open the floor to, to, um, to you all to um, have any queries or questions. Um, I've just got one question regarding the capital program. Mm -hmm. So have you set up, I mean, it doesn't come as a surprise if you look at the data program, mm -hmm. et cetera, but are you planning to set up uh, review system, say every quarter tracking finance tank. Oh, absolutely. So, so the majority of the work, um, the capital program of work, I guess it's fair to say with audit is around that water infrastructure because we've got. Well, um, actually, no, I shouldn't say that. It, it is across the board. So, yes, we will be because we've got um, things happening in the amenity space. It's also going to be reliant on um, contracting. Um, it's about an availability of contractors because there's a real shortage of any, any um, tradespeople or uh, builders or any construction done. There's, a, there's quite a delay. Um, and we did review our capital program of work for the, um, for the final... Um, for the version that we've got at the moment. Uh, and so we did look at that, but we're quite confident that we have, we can deliver it. I remember discussing that, but I'm just probably more specifically thinking if you've got the tools to get regular updates. Oh, absolutely. So Wellington Water will be doing that. They do that on a, um, they do the CapEx, they, they forecast every month, but we have a sit down meeting with them every month as well, and they go through that capital program of works and um, they are getting better at uh, forecasting that. So we will be tracking that. They also have a timeline of their projects of work. So with this year's um, CapEx program, a lot of their, uh, a lot of the budget is in this last quarter of the year. Um, and that was all around timing um, for them. So, so yes, that's something that we actively do. Roading as well, Tim is um, across that, and we can bring regular reports to plan on that, and um, amenities as well. Yeah. So we can do that. Because we don't, obviously, we don't want to be in a position you with know, seven, um, seven months into a financial year and we're going to force. Yeah, so all its concern around the capital to deliverability is really that you are um, collecting money from ratepayers before you are actually incurring the costs. Yeah. 
And on the roading one, there's mentioned there of that the roading asset management plan is quite light on the approach to forecasting renewals. Was this audit done prior to NZTA's underfunding of our renewals? Yes. Yep. So it's even worse now. Or well, potentially more. Yeah. Okay. And that's a national problem. Yep, yeah, totally. Yeah. It's not just uh, I, it was that. What was the underfunding of, of Masterman's roads was minimal. Oh, the horror was the one you wanted to look at. It was in the yeah. tens of millions. Yeah. yeah. We uh, we actually didn't do too bad, but what's ours? Total four hundred thousand. One point three million dollars. It's three hundred. Over three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. three years. Oh, that's yeah. over three. Years. That's over three years. Yeah. Yeah. Just a note of caution. I'd say also that same page forty-four. We're talking about um, one important of developing a assets management policy for us. Maybe there were six other shareholders, so they're going to be going. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But they're, they're a lot further down the track with the other councils than they are with us. Yeah, because they've been on board a lot longer and we, um, they are, uh, yeah, we're sort of, I guess, last year off the record first of all. Um, but so, equally, the um, source data, the number of other councils yeah. had the capacity to provide the source data into the system in the first place around an asset management plan. So, whereas we didn't have it. They, they are we didn't have one, we didn't have one at all, did we? No, no. They are promising to have an asset management plan that in place here within the next 12 months yeah, of this LTV. Yeah, cool. We have no, we had, no, but they're promising to do that over the next 12 months. Yeah. That's the asset management plan. That's yeah. crucial, yeah. yeah. As a condition report. They're yeah. doing some condition modeling, they won't be modeling the whole. No. Yeah. No one's put not, not, not as a not as a Not as in putting, uh, putting yeah, cameras down pipes. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of councils haven't actually done that work sufficiently. And that it's something that's a part of the stimulus funding we've, we've actually um, put, a, a, put a chunk of it to do that. Yeah. So um, Wellington Water as the assets and services guys are um, doing that. Interesting to get a like a map of, of, of the SAFY wrapper and just and be able to pinpoint with a aim. Oh, totally. That's what we want to do. It's a thing. Yeah. It's the plan. Yeah. So we're anticipating that we can finish within a year. Yep. Yeah. Oh, the, the modelling is ongoing throughout the long term yeah. plan. There is modelling every year yeah. and every every year of the budget. There is more modelling mm -hmm. because um, and more. Um, sorry. Condition assessment work, sorry, not modeling. Um, uh, because it's an ongoing piece of work, it's not something you just do once and then forget about, and it's not something that you can do for your whole network at one time. It's, um, it's an ongoing piece of work. Equally, you can get events like a seismic event, like a which disrupt pipes, and so you have to what, what you, you know, how stable the platform was or the geology was at one time can change. So oh, you yeah. need to be vigilant reacting to um, how, your, how your environment's changing as well. If we have a um, uh, prioritise our um, modelling or our looking at our infrastructure, we uh, well, well into water do that as part of the program of work, so prioritise our yeah. yeah, yeah. As we go into yeah. at the moment. Yeah, yeah they've, got, they've got some areas of concern <coughs> that they've already identified um, that they'll be sort of focusing on. Um, and then they'll sort of so, uh, other questions? No. Nope. Everybody's happy. Well, it was actually a bundle of reef. Exactly. Yeah.